Hello and uh, welcome to my uh, podcast. I'm your host Larry Liu, and uh, today I'm joined by uh, Rui Hang uh, Zheng. Uh, he is uh, currently uh, finishing up uh, his uh, music program, uh, a master's program, yeah, master's program. Uh, in uh, music uh, at um, the university. Uh, University of Westminster Choir oh, College. Westminster Choir College. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, f- because this is live, I, I'm not reading from notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, uh, w- welcome, uh, Rihan, to the program. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So, uh, you have decided to uh, study music. You grew up uh, in Sh- Shenzhen, uh, in China. Uh, so maybe let's uh, start from there. Uh, how was it like uh, growing up uh, in, uh, in in Shenzhen, and uh, you know what is it that drove you into the music field? Well, um, I never thought this question would come out. Um, so Shenzhen, my hometown. Actually, I'm I was born in Chengdu, Sichuan province, Chengdu, and then. Um, from my first years so, old, uh, my mother and father, my parents moved uh, to Shenzhen, and then I moved to. So, basically, Shenzhen is more like my my mother motherland uh, than Chengdu. Uh, des- describe music related to my. Uh, I have to say, Shenzhen is uh, the newest city in China right now. It's. Um, so your parents decided to move from Chengdu to uh, Shenzhen, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, th- that was related to economic reason you're getting a job? Mm, not quite an independent uh, job finding thing. It's um, their company assigned my dad a job, a position in Shenzhen, and also, um, you know, the Chinese uh, government uh, company. It's like not a comp- company making money by themselves, but mainly um, having the money from the government. So it's like a job position uh, change. Then my, my dad accepts and the whole family moved to Shenzhen. Yeah, uh, and uh, do, do you have any mu- musicians uh, in your family, or it's only you? <laughs> uh, if it's music major, or you want to make money in the future by your musicianship, or as a musician, uh, it's only me right now. But my dad can play guitar. I think it's how he how he um, attracts uh, my mom. <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah. He, he played a, a love song or something like oh, that yeah. on his guitar. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> I remember he said he spent his um, 20 years birthday just playing guitar by himself, uh, locked in the room and just playing guitar. Yeah, it's a very romantic man. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, that's, that might be something that's very encouraging uh, to, to you and me as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Looking for a love partner. Uh, but but uh, so... So, what was your uh, earliest uh, exposure uh, to music? Uh, when did it all start? Mm. So, um, I think it's when I was six years old, and me and my parents passing by a street, and there's a piano selling, but also uh, for piano education. There's a store in that street, and then my mom just happened to, okay, come in and let's talk about maybe you should learn piano since now. And then, uh, yeah, that's how I start. And then I keep going. Uh, I think I stopped for one year because my uh, middle school school work, um, the first huge tests. So very important for a kids, for a middle school kids. Um, I stopped one year, but and then keep going. And I played piano um, for my high school. So then I, because of 
that I can easily, well, more easy to get into a better high school than my, uh, well, like math, English, those score not helped me, but piano helped me. So you had a low score on all the other subjects. Yes. But uh, but you had a high score on piano and uh, music. And yeah, balance, you know. Mm. Uh, and uh, so so th that's how you learned uh, that music was was so inspiring, right, uh, to you at that point. Actually, in that time, uh, I was just um, like a worker, you know, like piano worker. I'm not interested in any of the like famous composer or really favored in of the classic music. I'm just playing piano and practicing, practicing, practicing. It's all about like, skill, you know, that thing. But not much um, the real musicianship means like the sense of music when you listen it the first time or when you're grabbing the score at the first time, then you can see directly or immediately see the composer's intention. At that time, I, I don't have any of that ability. I only know how to play piano faster and faster and clear, more clear sound, like da 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 da, -da. those kind of stuff. It's, I think, it's very common in Chinese pianists especially in the young pianists. So there was no particular uh, role model? I mean, because, you, I mean, there, there are famous people, Lang Lang, he's a well, of Chinese course, player. Um, uh, or Windy Li, which uh, <laughs> yeah. used to be a star, but right now is full. So there, was there any of the famous people that uh, inspired you or it had nothing to do Long with Long, of course. Okay. Long Long, it's uh, even now. Actually, I, I don't uh, I don't admire or respect uh, him in the in the past. Like when I was uh, 16 or 15, uh, at that time, I think his movement and gesture and sound, it's too exaggerated. But uh, when I Getting older and older, I find Long Lang is uh, an incredible person. Especially, he just released, uh, I think, 2021. He released an um, album. He playing Bach, um, Goldenberg. Yeah. It's fabulous. I never thought he can, you know, still play so well. Well, I mean, Bach, it, a lot of pianists uh, or violinists, uh, cellists, those instrumentalists, they will have in a career uh, climax uh, or high points. And then um, when they calm themselves down, they will get back to Bach. So I think Lan Lan recently, I think he felt something different, with whether his skill we all know the whole world know Long Long's piano skill. It's <laughs> yeah, I've I've listened to right. one of his performances yeah. and uh, it, finally it's, it's he's still getting great. back to to Bach, and it's a classic classic piece, Goldenberg. Yeah, that's it's very inspiring. But 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 back then, as you said, uh, this wasn't high uh, on your radar. Um, I, there's this one story I found interesting. Uh, I don't know if you know about Elton John. Um, he's a, a pop musician uh, from Britain, the UK. Mm. Um, and uh, he was trained in the um, Royal Conservatory Music in London mm. uh, as a kid. Um, and what was very striking about him is that he uh, could listen to a piece and then he could play uh, by the ear which means mm -hmm. that uh, you know so he listens to it and then he can play it so he doesn't have to study the notes yeah. uh, which is a, it's a very rare skill it seems to be uh, and he was um, when he started 
um, for the audition to get into the conservatory, uh, uh, he he very much impressed the the instructor, uh, and, uh, and and that's how he got started, uh, you know. And uh, but then he uh, integrated you know piano music uh, into pop music, mm -hmm. uh, as you might know if you <coughs> listen to a lot of his. Uh, uh, songs, you know. Alton John, wait a minute. Uh, is is that the one who wrote um, Lion King? Lion King, like, yeah. Uh, uh, Goodbye, Yellow Brick Road, uh, Your Song, uh, um, Penny and the Jets. Uh, there, there's so many compositions. I have a whole uh, playlist on my mm -hmm. YouTube uh, uh, channel just to, you know, uh, amazed at his. Uh, and his compositions, but it, it, but what, what do you think about this idea of like, you know, integrating piano music into, into pop music? Because because normally when we think of pop music, it's guitar, bass, and the drums, right, and then the vocal. Uh, so that's the core of what pop music is, and rock music, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah, integrating the piano into. Uh, pop songs, I think, is a very uh, yeah special uh, thing. I I think you you're talking about uh, mainly it's about the arrangement because I I I'm always curious uh, how the how a band composed because well you know a lot of um, there's heavy metal like German band and a lot of uh, Green Day. It's one of my favorite band from my high school time, and I'm I'm always curious how they composed, like one compose and then arrange for like bass guitar and drum, snare drum a lot the, those drum sets. How how one knows so many instruments and like chords, how to play. So if only one composer in that band, he has to like provide a score for the drummer and then for the for the bass and for the guitar and if there's a synchronizer as a synthesizer he has to like maybe hire people or provide score as well and or there's um an orchestra version like there's strings wood wings who is going to do that job like arrange score managing all the stuffs just a band you know it has to be someone that can decide other thing like uh, we're using G major here not F major right you're wrong <laughs> some so somebody has, has to say that right so it has to be one composer uh, well it's not or a team of composers actually um no so the the um the thing i want to say that's um if there's a piano and someone can p play piano and how he turned into um, pop music and compose so many songs as we can hear like there's a beautiful event, uh, arrangement like guitar and strings those sound I think the idea and uh, well the motive or the theme the material Elton John provides and I'm not sure if he produced the music by himself or he signed for a company and the company has a producer that can do the job for him. Because I, well, we know lots of pop stars, maybe someone can compose, but sometimes, well, mainly they just provide an idea, provide a chord progression, provide a melody something like that or it's like Lady Gaga he uh, she can wrote a song like playing guitar and singing records that called a demo and then he sent it to a company on the producer uh, like the those gold producer they can arrange to a, a simple song and then to a to a hot song you know so, so they, they, they they would write uh, all of the notes uh all of the scores uh, for uh, all of the instruments. So there has to be one person who oversees it. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's the job uh, of the producer. But, well, if, um, 
I believe Bru Bruno Mars or uh, what is his name? Another American singers. I, I believe those guys can definitely write down all the notes by themselves. Um, and also answer your question about the piano. <coughs> so it can uh, relate it to uh, another thing called improvising. So, well, if you're playing so many pieces uh, from like whatever Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, our romantic period composer, uh, and you will get an idea that it's um, living in your blood. So if you put your hands on the piano and you can play maybe mix Beethoven, mix Brahms, mix Champagne, and it's living with you. So and you you improvising the melody or the harmony in your mind and without having studied the notes beforehand? Without improvising like no score, you're just playing, freely playing. By your mind. After listening to it at least no, once, right? Uh, not listening to anything, just having an idea. Even you are not sure about like uh, if it's a melody, if it's a, a beautiful harmony progression. You don't even know, but you just play. Hands moving first, and then maybe you play while recording, or may. Maybe you played and and then you realize what a beautiful um, section or a beautiful passage, and then you keep thinking, keep uh, remember, memorize those notes, harmony, and then you write it down, and that can be a well, jazzy or a or pop funk, music. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, it can be it can be arranged to a funk music. Now when you change the rhythm, to uh, can be. A, Transferred to a, a lot of different genres, you know, this music idea. Like, uh, I always like to say this, like Rachmaninoff, uh, Piano Concerto Number Two. Its first movement, second movement, or third movement it has been arranged to a lot of version. Like even this uh, Japanese anime, um, they arranged uh, uh, the third movement to a pop song. It's very beautiful. It maintained the melody and just changed some some chords, but it still got a soul, got a Rachmaninoff soul inside. It's very beautiful. Yeah, one of my all-time favorite songs, uh, uh, the Fifth of Beethoven, yeah. uh, which was uh, you know redone by Walter Murphy. Uh, Walter Murphy and the Big Apple Band. I think uh, you played for me. Yeah, in the back in yeah. I think nineteen seventy five or something like that. It was at the height uh, of the disco era, which ah. of course <laughs> is uh, is my home music. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but it was really fascinating, um, you know, the way how he did it, right? Um, so um, so it's it's really. It's definitely the fifth of Beethoven, but mm -hmm. it mixes with the the, the the funk and the disco sound, right? Yeah, um, just developed to uh, just make made a, another development, not as Beethoven did, but he used the first idea, which is the main motif by Beethoven. Da 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 da. Yeah, exactly. The, and then he that's developed. The it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I say, and also one thing I have to say about uh, Elton John, um, uh, when you mention, you know, how does he actually compose um, the songs? Uh, I I know that he, um, so there, there was this one video that I saw of him, um, where he explained to an audience, where he explained to journalists, uh, how he composed the songs. Mm. Uh, it's all by himself, by the way, um, but. Um, uh, he said that, you know, he was good in singing, he was good in composing, and he was good in playing the piano all by himself. Mm. But he struggled with the lyrics, uh, because as you might know, in every, I mean, obviously, like in, you know, some funk, soul, jazz music, you know, yeah. you, you don't you don't really need vocal. Uh, it's all instrumental. 
uh, but uh, but he was a pop musician, so he needed the, the lyrics. Mm. Um, and um, so <clears throat> when he was uh, in his late teens, a teenager mm. uh, in, in London, uh, in the UK, um, he went to a, a record studio mm. um, and uh, he was a nobody. So, you know, the record producers didn't pay any attention to him. And mm. he was asking, can you find me a lyricist? And, uh, and then he took the top envelope uh, from the from the table, and and, and gave it to Elton John, um, and uh, and you know, he took out the contact info. You know the phone number uh, was on the on the subway riding back home, uh, and he called up a guy named Bernie Toppin. Bernie Toppin was a person that uh, that filed an application with that uh, record label, mm. uh, and then uh, and they were about the same age. Uh, and the two of them, Bernie and Elton John, became the two best friends and the best mm. collaborators. Wow. Um, and the way how they worked was very interesting. So they didn't sit together in the same room. Mm. So uh, Bernie uh, Toppin would write the lyrics and then he would um, fax it back then in the 1970s, uh, mm. in the early 1970s. Uh, he would fax it to Elton John uh, or, you know, just give it to him when he sees him um and then and then elton john would read the lyrics um and then s sometimes he doesn't feel anything and he's like okay throw it away uh and then sometimes he f he feels something in mm -hmm. his mind when he reads the lyrics and then he goes to his piano and he sits down and he starts hitting the keys mm. yeah uh, and he starts, you know, of course, uh, verbalizing, singing mm -hmm. the the lyrics uh, while he's composing the, um, the the notes for the song. Yeah. Um, and 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 we know that he's a genius, I think, mm. because it would take him fifteen minutes to do it, right? I mean, this is the 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 assuredness that he had. Right. Mm. I read this lyrics and then I sit down and I compose the song. Uh, and after f 10 or 15 minutes, I have the song. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you know, you know, he maybe needs the drum. He maybe needs, you know, some other instruments to, mm. to go with the song. But but the core of the song um, of every song, of John's song is the piano. Right. Yeah. Sometimes uh, just the. Um most important of the feature of a song is maybe just a couple of seconds. Even for a one hour symphony, uh, some people will edit um, a section. Maybe just last for um, well, 30 seconds. Right. But um, well, for uh, three minutes, well, um, average three minutes pop song uh, actually i think it's the same like the most shining parts sometimes the just the, the second the second verse or the second section right well yeah, but i mean how fair is a comparison between let's say a pop song um and you know classical music composition um because in a pop song we have you know four chords right uh, that that's the that, that's the core of a lot of <laughs> pop songs right um, and then and then in you know classical music oh. uh, I, I, I didn't study classical music at all so I'm mm. very ignorant about it but uh, but there's so many different parts I mean if you uh, who's like the four seasons is it Vivaldi Haydn or oh, Haydn mm, yeah of the, of the four, four season, seasons, four seasons, Vivaldi, Vivaldi yes. right? Mm. And it's but it's always you know, but it's always different, right? Um, well, um, four chords <laughs> were pop song. A lot of people would get mad by saying that, <laughs> especially <laughs> fans, uh, fans of Jacob Collier <laughs> or Charlie Puth. Um, or, uh, Talking, uh, uh, thinking about the uh, difference between these two, um, I won't say 
pop music is a genre. I, I don't think it's correct, but and also classic music is not a genre, but um, but a difference. I think just uh, like the pop song, sometimes you have uh, like the first materials. Uh, I don't know the English word for that. Uh, but in Chinese, we call it zhu ge, right? It's the first verse or the first theme. And then you got uh, maybe a bridge and then get into the second theme, second material, which uh, the climax of the song. So, so, so there's, there's like three musical parts, you could say, yes. with the, the verse, uh, the chorus, and then the bridge. So you have to think about the, those three. Um, uh, actually, I'm thinking like the first first part and then the second part, which is the climax and then a recapitulation. Recapitulation. Um, actually, for, from uh, symphony, uh, especially the classical period, like Beethoven's symphony, especially the like those first movements, uh, it's the same structure, but lasts longer and bigger scale uh, using not use, using not only um, like five instruments guitar uh, bass maybe let's say two guitar and one bass and a drum and a vocal right um, by using like uh, actually Beethoven's um, early symphony is not considered right now the symphony is not a big scale but in that time, I think still, well, compared to Mozart's, um, it has to be, say, a, a, a big scale, large symphony uh, using two trumpets, um, two trombone, uh, and the whole woodwinds, not, not very much doubling each other, but string also and uh, timpani. It's very. I don't want to say basic, but it's quite normal at that time to to use that skill and just it, he developed the the idea. Like let's say a first theme, he developed. Well, the first theme can only last for like one minutes, and then he make this idea develop to uh, let's say eight minutes. <laughs> it can be two pop pop songs, right? And then he used the second theme. The second theme can be generated by the first theme, or it just can comes from nowhere, like a totally new materials, and then develop to another ten minutes, and then recapitulation uh, another eight minutes, and here we are. We got uh, like twenty six minutes movement, right? and yeah. And also, it got bridges. Like sometimes the main material didn't didn't sound, but you got some uh, like first material and the second material between those two. You can have a like a forty seconds bridge, like playing by any of the instrument parts. So the difference, I don't think. Um, from from me, uh, for me, uh, not the structural difference, but the timbre, and like you said, lyric. In the classic music, if there's a lyric or a song to sing, usually, um, mm, well, chorus, right? The chorus, it's yeah. a choir, or an aria. Oh, yeah. Sung by a soprano, and the way of singing, it's not like pop song. That is also a main difference. Well, uh, like Mahler wrote a lot of uh, art song, and sing German. Um, but the song, the way of singing, first of all, is different, and the accompaniments by the whole orchestra. It's also from, uh, I think from, mainly for me is the timber and the way of singing. I mean, in, 
and also yeah, you mentioned the orchestra. I mean, it's a lot of people uh, that are on stage. I mean, if you go to a classical music concert, you know, you might have you know thirty musicians, or um, and you know more than half of them um, with the, like the string instrument, like yeah. vi violin or. Well, if you uh, consider that's... consider is my mother uh, symphony number no. eight, it wrote like a symphony for a thousand, and I remember um, in Los Angeles, then, uh, yeah, Los Angeles uh, orchestra. Uh, I don't remember which year, maybe two thousand seventeen or eighteen. Uh, they did. A program about this symphony, and they really hired more than one thousand people oh, in wow. that program. Yeah, the chorus I think it above eight hundred already. The whole Disney concert hall it's like filled out by those singers, whether it's like young um, mixed choir or the boy choir or the mixed choir. So what's the advantage with the numbers? I mean, is it about the, the, oh. the, the loudness of it? I mean, you know, everybody can hear it uh, even more. Oh. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm, an, I'm an ignorant <laughs> person. I'm not a music student, so I, know, I, know. I can be as ignorant as I'm not as judging possible. you. Just, I'm just, I think it's interesting that, this, well, I'm a musician and I always like to find an appropriate English word by, for myself. Uh, sometimes describe uh, music or do doing a presentation, but I never chose like loudness. <laughs> it's never <laughs> been through my mind. Uh, I may say sonority, like the big sonority. Uh, yeah, um, also back to Verdi's Requiem um, or Berlioz's Requiem. Uh, they're using like the brass band. Also, Mahler. Second Symphony also used uh, uh, the brass band like far from the stage to create uh, sonority. That is, the sound comes from very far away to describe like the resurrection, uh, the main theme of that symphony. Um, so I think the number of the people yeah, I think it's the sonority, because in the romantic periods, people are uh, persuade, persuading the, well, I think loudness, actually, it's a good word to describe that, so, bah! the heavy sound, like that, somebody will, will wrote uh, on the score, like, for, for tccccccismo. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I, I noticed that uh, in these you know, symphony orchestras that there is some kind of hierarchy to some extent because uh, because the audience, I mean, you know, when I sit in the audience, mm -hmm. I always pay attention uh, to the conductor uh, because he's the guy who gets on the stage, he, he moves his arms um, and, you know, if he does this, then they stop all of a sudden, right? Mm. Uh, and then the second person I pay attention to is the is the pianist, um, because there's only one usually, right? Yes. Um, because it, it, with the, with the you know the violin, the string players, I don't pay too much attention to them, um, mm. even though they are an integral part to the orchestra experience. Yeah. But I think it's about it's about the numbers. You know what I mean? Like. Yes. The, uh, one instrument by an individual person. Like you said, um, the violin, the whole string section, um, probably, yeah, well, if it's a large scale, it will more than 30 uh, person play in the, in the string section. But, um, yeah, I don't think one will really pay attention to a specific violinist or celloist unless they had they are having a astonishing moments or astonishing melody like 
like Brahms Symphony Number no. Four, when like the first movement, when the cello is this, like almost like sighing, uh, singing. I'm not saying the right key, sorry, but that is the moment that people will pay attention to the whole cello section. Okay, they will, they will be like, whoa, oh, there's a cello section there, and also maybe. Um, and what about the wind uh, instruments? The woodwind. Ah, uh, that. Um, <laughs> the, the trumpets and. Uh, trumpets. Like that. Wow. Um, uh, talking about trumpet, I don't think the trumpet can be ignored, because well, first of all, the it's very hard to to not making a mistakes um, in the whole concerts or in another world, like seeing uh, playing perfectly. Um, like last time at the Beethoven number no. nine, the trumpet it's and also the horn section and there's horrible. Uh, yeah, it's horrible. So it made me rethink about those fabulous recording on Spotify. Like it's, after that concert, I make me thinking. It's, it's incredible and it's almost impossible to making, like during the past decades, to making those um, fabulous recording, and while I listen to the live concert, like those, especially the brass band. It's so easy to to hear them making mistakes, or well, some violinists uh, maybe in the back seat of the second violin, they may well if the wrong vibrato or a wrong bowing, people may ignore not notice them. it. Yeah, okay. not notice that. But trumpets, uh, yeah, to ignore yeah, it. no one will ignore that. It's too obvious. Yeah, and, and and then in the back uh, of the orchestra, there's uh, usually a few drummers, boom, boom, uh, boom, boom, percussion. boom, the percussionists, um, and then the the gong, you know, boom, uh, uh, boom. yeah. So, uh, a so, so the symbol, yeah. So, so that that's also you know interesting uh, experience, you know, listening to that. Right? Uh, I remember those, you know. And also, it depends on uh, which piece. Depends on the music. I remember, um, two thousand fourteen to two thousand twelve. I don't remember the exact uh, year, but it's the New Year concerts in Berlin Philharmonie, and it's conducted by uh, Simon Rattle, Sir Simon, and the piccolo. Uh, they're playing the dun 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 dun, and the piccolo playing um, I think two measures before four measures before, um, <coughs> uh, so it it's wrong <laughs> and there's some mistakes. So Sir Simon restart the whole piece again. It's oh, wow. definitely a car crash and uh, an accident and. The Berlin uh, Philharmonic Digital Concert, they have to like edit, uh, remove that mistake and remove the whole thing, almost like re redo the the whole piece, and then to post on their website. So, <laughs> yeah, those you mean those um, individual player that can catch more attention by the audience but also they're taking more risks like uh, Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms um, it contains a piano mm -hmm. and and also in the very beginning dong, da -da 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 -da. if the pianist play a wrong notes and for the audience, it's very uh, actually it's it's quite unusual for audience to hear piano sound in an orchestra because not that much um, piece well compared to other symphonies or violin concerto or those things. Of course, piano concerto contains piano, um, but that piece it's perfectly 
making the piano sound into the music. When a piano is at the center of the performance. Well, right? it depends on how was the the staging, you know, how the direct uh, directors uh, conductor things. Um, some version will put the piano in the middle. Um, some version will put them on the side, maybe near the harps. Yeah, and some well, like Carnegie Hall, um, the stage actually is not very big, so it will they may consider to put a piano on another corner or something because you want um, you don't want to the string or the other instruments being prevents the visually prevents by the piano because well all the time they're using Steinway so it's a very big piano now so you mentioned uh, like making uh, mistakes as being one of the most traumatic experiences of being a musician um, uh, yeah especially if like live audience you know a lot of people uh, listening in um, I mean, and you have, you know, made um, quite a few live performances, right, um, mm -hmm. in your life. I mean, w like, do you ever go in to a concert um, with this kind of nervosity, like where you are concerned that, you you know, you're going to sing the wrong tune or you're going <laughs> to make the wrong movement, uh, you know? Conducting I, I, I sound the wrong tune all the time. <laughs> um, and for the for human voice, it's well at least for those people who don't have perfect pitch, um, and even they have perfect pitch, um, it's hard to to do the same thing as the instrumentalists did. Because, well, if I play, let's say I play an, an A on piano, right? I just play the A key. And if I'm going to sing A and then I sing, my vocal folder is made by meat, you know, made by my own body. So uh, can be unstable. But a piano, bang, and you got a sound. You don't have to worry about like uh, how is the piano today? Uh, how is it today? Is that too tired today? Yeah, <laughs> you it's, want, it's you like want. very constant. Yeah. yeah, you don't worry about that. But some of the woodwind instruments like oboe, uh, clarinets, you, mm, mm, you may have to really care about the, the reeds, right? oboe, the double reeds. You have to like uh, really consider the humid of whether it's the room, the weather. So you have to very careful um, to pay attention to that. It's like um, I think for some uh, some of the player, they're taking the reeds as their baby. I spend a lot of money and pay more, very much attention to it. Well, for me, the, the biggest stress point for like wind instruments. Um, is um, like the amount of oxygen <laughs> breathing in all the time and then, whoo, and then you have to blow all the time. I, I, I guess like you get used to it as a professional player, but still th this would be something that would cause me some anxiety. And, oh. uh, After spending spending two years uh, for master degree, I sometimes i confused by... I, which one can be basic, uh, which one can be uh, extraordinary or can be, say, uh, perfect, uh, or which one can be, say, well, well, you have to do it. It's, it's your job, right? So playing wrong notes, uh, obviously, is not their job. But consider the piece, uh, consider any of the situation can be uh, can tell maybe it is hard to not playing a single note wrong during a two hours concert 
So I may say, as an individual, as a musician, we have to ask ourselves or demand ourselves strictly for only ourselves, but not for for the others. But the most interesting thing is uh, I'm a conductor, so I have to like ask other people and demand them to not making mistakes. So this job, well, now now we're talking about how hard uh, or why it's conductor earns more money, <laughs> right? We are not only caring、uh, about ourselves, but we have to find a Find a way that we can better express our own idea, and then say to people and make them better as well. So you have been、uh, training the past two years、uh, to become a conductor. Yes.、Uh, and presumably, if you continue on with your、uh, doctoral studies,、um, yeah. you've also been conducting, right? Yeah.、Um, so, what what is it that drove you?、Uh, Towards conducting, I mean, what is、uh, so appealing about,、uh, you know, di- directing other musicians、uh, in the、yeah. performance?、Uh, <laughs> I answered the same question you just asked for like four times already because、yes. <laughs> I just had、uh, the last、uh, few weeks like doing all the auditions, so well. Considering this question, I'm still thinking.、Uh, will be the same answer like I answered the other、um, school like during the, this interview. It's because during my my undergrad years,、uh, especially the first two years,、um, I was in piano major, and then I found out、um, lots of students they play. Not only piano, but maybe like flutes,、uh, clarinet, trumpets, like you said, and violin. Even I didn't, I didn't know very well this instrument or the、uh, specific piece、uh, of famous person, a famous composer. I don't know.、Uh, during that time, I don't even know like the、uh, Sibelius and his violin concerto. So, but I just feel like those st- students or my my colleagues, uh, right, my classmates, they're not playing very well, or in another words,、uh, in that time very arrogant, like not satisfied. I'm not satisfied by those sound, or by those playing. Even I know my my own playing.、Um, On the piano, it's not satisfying <laughs> by myself, but I want to find a way to like say to these people, like, you should play this, blah 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 blah. You should play this, blah 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 blah.、Mm-hmm. You can do better, blah blah blah. Those things. Right now, thinking of all of this,、um, it's really stupid,、um, but it's simple and direct.、Mm-hmm. It's this motivation that drive me to, well, conductor. It's a, it's a role of you must know everything, and you have the rights, and it's your job to telling people what to do. I know this make also、uh, making a lots of people mad, like telling people what to do. <laughs> You're just letting people do what they want to do. You're not letting, and you're not making them to do. But for me, I think, to be honest, the facts and the reality, indeed, it's you telling people what to do. So you you're saying that the conductor needs to have a certain personality, right? The personality is,、um, you could say, domineering,、uh, controlling to some extent. Uh, being self-confident and in,、uh, in 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 the, yeah, like your judgment of、um, the、uh, performance of the、uh, other musicians,、um, and、uh, you are sort of uh, supervising uh, that performance, making sure that it's 
works out, right? Or well, even some people would disagree, but I absolutely agree with what you just said. Yes, it's you're supervising, you're judging all the time,、mm-hmm. and by doing that, you have to have a very clear mind, and you know. How the music goes, and you know what's the music in your mind, and you know how to make that sound. So, well, it's your job to supervising everything. It's your job to. You、and、can that, say, and、uh, that's for all of the musicians in the orchestra. So you have to, because like if you're like a violin player,、mm-hmm. you just have to know how to play violin, right? You don't、yes. really have to、yeah. care about the oboe, clarinet, and <laughs> piano, and all the other guys, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, but well,、um, I forgot his name. But if、uh, a violinist, like let's say the first violin,、uh, and it's the、um, the concert master, if somebody really have the motivation or really have the interest in looking at a full score or in like hearing or while supervising, like do the conductor's job, I know a conductor. Who used to be a a concert master? Who used to be a violinist? And then, after Leonard Bernstein found him, oh, this young man really got some、uh, talents, and he works really hard. Like he's just playing violin in orchestra. But if I'm not here, he can definitely take control.、Uh, just yeah, take control of the whole orchestra, like doing the conductor's job. Yeah, so I think、uh, one's own indiv- like individual motivation is very important, and also related to the、uh, individual、um, study. You know, whatever you study, the motivation, not power. Yeah, motivation should be the the right words. Right,、uh, you and you have to. Uh, study yeah, all of the instruments essentially. I mean, it, it, yeah, I guess I guess my question would be, what does a conductor do if he's not on stage? Because obviously, from the audience perspective, <laughs> I can see、yeah. you know visually what the conductor does during the performance. But outside of the performance, in terms of the preparation for you know the concert、uh, or you know interacting yeah with the musicians or You know, studying、uh, the notes, the sheets.、Um, wh- what does a conductor do? Yeah, mainly, <laughs> it's just playing on a piano, playing the full score on the piano.、Mm. Well, if it's、uh, a symphony, playing piano.、Uh, if it's a violin concerto, playing the part on the piano, playing the whole thing. Right? It's all about playing on the piano. With full score, so you know the harmony. You're watching the score while playing, and you know how the dynamics go, and you decide how the phrase go. Where the woodwind to take breath, you has to decide. Well, of course, a lot of professional orchestra, the woodwind, they will decide by themselves, of course, but. If someday you're not satisfied by their breathing, and then it makes well some、uh, makes a phrase that kind of breaks or have a little pause that、like、a conductor don't like, that it it can show the the reason why he should decide by himself first before the rehearsal. So all of this stuff and your Deciding how the violin,、uh, how the string is bowing, how dynamics the double bass should play, even the score, it's written a pianissimo. But maybe there's a, a brass comes in,、uh, or a woodwinds. It's well rating in the different dynamics, and then you think about the. Auditorium. Sometimes the concert hall. May, maybe you will think about the sound. If the contrabass playing in the pianissimo, maybe the audience cannot hear 
the notes, but you think it's quite important because it's well, it's the bass note. So you may consider to change the dynamic, and during the rehearsal, you're gonna tell them if they're playing too soft. You may like tell them, okay, this phrase or from measure blah 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 to measure. Tell them to play like from pianissimo to mezzo piano, probably. Yeah, some. Well, it can be lots of, lots of things. But in my mind, I think it has to, has to making decision. It's all about making decision and find a better way, a more efficient way. It, it don't. Uh, it doesn't need to be nice. It's no necessary for mm -hmm. very nice, um, or even. Myself uh, personally, of course, who doesn't love or likes a, a nice person? But I don't think it's necessary. But you have to know what you're gonna tell them, and what would happen, what's the results if they do what you said, or if they don't agree with you, how would you react? Right? Because even a lot of master. The maestro conductor, mm. they were having trouble with, <laughs> with some instrument player. They would they would challenge them. Right? I don't need you to tell me how to play my instruments. Right? A lot of those things happen. I I have seen. So you so had many. experience with confrontations. Uh, yeah, of course. I I don't think well. I don't think uh, a conducting major student. Should avoid those um, situation, and in but um, in a contrast, I think it's necessary for um, when you are students and deal with those situation in an appropriate way, because no one likes to uh, if you challenge me and I, I somehow I call you back. I don't like do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just mm, it's all about the task, and we have to make it efficient because time limited. Um, yeah. So for potential, you know, wannabe conductors who are listening to this podcast, uh, they <laughs> they will want to know, like, if you face a confrontation um, mm -hmm. with, let's say, uh, a, a musician who has. You know, you could say a fiery temper, mm. who is very uh, impatient and, you know, is you know, not very open to you could say listen to uh, interference uh, and you know, you know, change. You know, do this, do that. Um, what is your advice to uh, to other conductors in how to handle uh, a situation like that? Mm. Uh, is this broadcast a loud curse word? Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest like to, uh, to just having the same mode as uh, when somebody is maybe having a bad day or getting mad. It's always um, the conductor's job to make make things going uh, or how to say like rehearse to make the the whole rehearsal like oh, not following the plan actually but it has to making the rehearsal going making progress is the conductor's job always so if I suggest a conductor to like just having argue with them until you win that is absolutely wrong. So I would suggest if some conductors are listening to this broadcast, just ignore whatever they said. Just ignore them. And if they're still playing the wrong notes, it's their fault. Everyone in the orchestra can hear that if they're making mistake but still say something uh, bad to you. A lot of musician they will stand or supports you. Okay. They can hear, so just ignore them and still. But you have to um, 
stand how to say this like um, stand the ground yeah you have to not hesitate about your decision like a lot of a lot of time like um like in the like in the choral music sometimes we're deciding which vowel to sing or where to put the consonants mm -hmm. whether it's uh, eight rests or 16th rests right and where to take breath and which uh, what kind of latin we're using it's all the decision that conductors will made before the rehearsal but um there are many times uh even i faced this situation myself as well like the singer will ask you about is there really a ein, not ian, something like that, right? Or are we seeing t or t? Yeah, something like that. you have to know <laughs> what 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 thing they're gonna sing, right? You have to know, and you say to them very quick, like if some of the instrument player is challenging you, you just answer them very quick and then keep going make everything you said or response efficient quickly right consider every moment as the last moment of the rehearsal like the the last one minutes of the rehearsal what you're gonna do right yeah. efficiency is the most important don't don't just start a fight yeah. on yeah. the stage yeah. even if it's a rehearsal just yeah. don't do that but you have to uh, sometimes to act as a bad person on the stage because it's your job. You have to tell them sometimes um, you have to take the, the courage to just speak out some problem, some wrong things. And I, tr I believe if they're professional players, they will understand. If they're not, they will like having trouble with you. Like they always blame someone else. Mm -hmm. But people like to, even myself, a lot of time I would think, oh, it's not my fault. But if you really take a moment and rethink about that issue, you will think, actually, it's my problem, not anyone else. I can fix by myself why I'm blaming other people, right? Yeah, it's, it's a really big challenge. Uh the deciding in every moment you know how are you going to intervene uh, uh, and uh, but, but your point about efficient communication I think is yeah. is, is very good um, it's not just being a conductor I would say that uh, you know in, in any aspect of life I mean you know being being an academic a teacher a lecturer yeah. uh, you know being a politician or you know I think in any occupation I think um, you know, effective communication. Yes. I, I think is, is is incredibly important. And also make it make it funnier. Yeah, be be um, having humor. Yeah, it's also very important. So well, if you cannot thinking uh, of any like funny ways, just answer them directly. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So, okay, so you, an earlier point that you raised was um, that you use that you play on the piano, uh, mm -hmm. and um, it's the piano performance that allows you to envision the the, the concert. Um, yeah. Um, but 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 th that applies to all of the instruments that are being used um, in the in the concert. Um, is is that because you could say the piano is like the the central instrument uh, that uh, you could say uh, it, it's it's like the heart of that the heart, performance. The key. Um, yeah, almost like <laughs> because you know if if you listen to a pop song, you always remember the guitar, right? I mean, yeah. even though you have the drum, you have the bass line, sure, but in the vocal. Mm. But a funk music, I know. Right? Yeah, well, with a, with a, with a funk music, it's yeah. it's the bass and then the guitar, mm -hmm. uh, b both parts uh, that, that come together, and and that's always the one that 
that that that I remember, right? Um, and that that you know keep me addicted to that song, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I must assume that the conductor with the classical music um, is uh, works also like that, you know, using the piano as a as a key instrument, right? Yeah, of course. I um, if somebody um, some conductor has um, really really good audition skill, like uh, Claudio Abado, he just looking at a score and he will he will be able to hear everything on that score. Um, but of course, I. I don't believe if Abado doesn't play uh, the full score on piano, maybe at least just once. I don't believe if he cannot play any of the instruments. Um, but yeah, the well, maybe some strings of violin, especially violinists, will disagree. Like because uh, I remember this. Uh, a YouTube channel. Uh, remember a, a scene that a violinist say to a pianist like, "Can you do a crescendo, right? Or can you do a legato? A legato of well, kind of a crescendo for one note, impossible, right? Because well, if you play crescendo, you have to play multiple times on one note." So it's impossible because piano, the, the sound of one note on piano, it's decreasing. Uh, you can only do is diminuendo, not crescendo. Mm -hmm. uh, just playing one note at once, boom, it will disappear. Whereas the violin is like, e it, it yes. can, can make it really long. Uh. Yeah. So in that part, um, a lot of instruments all can, can do the thing that piano cannot do um, but also piano has 88 kids right 88 kids and then keys yeah. yeah we one can play on the piano for just play the whole uh your 10 fingers bang, and make the chord progression that part it's no any other instrument can do that as natural as piano can provide and as convenient as piano can can do and especially for composers those ideas happens on piano it's um simple the simplest speaking I will be the harmony yeah so the harmony the melody so that comes from the piano and then and then once you have the piano part together then you figure out then you do uh, the arrangement the, 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 the yeah. other instruments that's right um, yeah <clears throat> so of course one of my favorite uh, bands of all time chic uh, the I played a lot of songs from them uh, now mm -hmm. Rogers uh, yeah, yeah. is the main guitar player um, and um, when he so he grew up in New York City, um, mm. uh, and um, and he was very musical, um, but he didn't go to like a music high school. It was a normal high school, uh, and he played uh, clarinet um, mm. in, the, in the in the school band. Um, and even though it was not a music school, but he paid so much attention to um, to how to you know read. The notes, uh, mm. the string orchestration, yeah. um, and the, the theory of it, with, without, you know, ever playing, you know, uh, a, a, a string instrument, mm. um, he would, he would be able to to orchestrate, uh, to write the notes, uh, for um, uh, for the string orchestra, mm. um, and then when he, so of course he made his money. In you know pop pop music, uh, and then in uh, the disco era, that's when he took off, uh, mm. 1977. Um, and um, and at, at at that point, you know, funk and disco music, 
there was a little bit of orchestration. I mean, if you look at, uh, I think, Cool and the Gang, Earth, Wind and Fire, mm -hmm. these were like really big bands, you know, African American. Yeah, um, contained brass bands. Yeah, the bra tribal brass bands. Tribal, yeah, they had they had a lot of instruments in it. Mm -hmm. um, but what was really remarkable about Sheik, um, because Sheik, it was it used to be only these two guys. It was Nile Rogers on the guitar, mm -hmm. and Bernard Edwards was on the on the bass. Mm -hmm. And then he invited a few other friends like Tony Thompson on the on the drum. I, I know all of these people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, L Luther Vandross and uh, Lucy Martin and uh, Norma Jean Anderson. These were the vocalists. Um, but then they also had uh, three violin players. Yeah. Um, uh, Karen Milner, um, uh, Hong, and then the third person I forgot. But but anyway, but what's so remarkable is that you know he didn't have to call in you know a, a, an external composer mm. to, uh, to 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 write the, the string orchestration um, for for the chic songs. Um, it was it was all just Nile Rogers himself um, who who did it. And that, 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 that's why I think he's um, he's a composer, he's a producer, um, and he's a guitar player uh, yeah. of the band. So which I mean, it, it, it's it's definitely so that, 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 that's why I mean for the pop music world. I mean, I have a special appreciation for Elton John and for Nile Rogers for those two guys. Yeah. Because because they are more than the normal, you know, <laughs> pop musician. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, uh, I feel like it's just because the the music, the the timbre or the harmonics, the the drum, all the th stuff that happens um, is together and making the this different style of music, different sounds, and finally get into different genre. Uh, say like funk music, and then compared to classic music, like a symphony. Uh, to be honest, after my auditions um, these days, I haven't listened to a single classic music, or I haven't opened a single symphony album. Uh, these days, uh, last week uh, or this week, I only listen to pop music recently, because, well, in the um, past few weeks, I'm listening to, like having a brainwash, uh, ear wash of uh, symphonies, choral symphony, other classic music. Well, you know, people will get tired. Whatever who it is. Especially for for me, um, born after ninety five, so pop music it's part of me, and also classic music also part. Do, of do, me. do you think that with classical music you have to concentrate more? You have to focus more on whatever the instruments and the and the tones, and you have to think about it very deeply because also because you. Um, because you because you played on the piano as well, so you think um, about it very intellectually. While for the pop music, you're just listening to it, and it's it's fun. Uh, okay, actually, you you mentioned this, and it's very interesting because the classic music uh, when I listen to it, it's not only uh, like I want to thinking something about the music. I want to find out what, what tone. Like what tonality was the tonal center and when uh, which key it modulates to it's not I want to not listen purely because it's automatically pushed me to think all these stuffs and it even it's or well, it's not very hard but energy consuming just even just a little bit but it's not like and sometimes my classmate will say to you when I put on my headphones and listen to a classic music my hands will move 
like I will automatically um, you're the conductor basically yeah I will move my hand and just having the feeling and just automatically conduct sometimes I well sometimes I realize that but I couldn't stop it's because the music is leading my arms to somewhere to beating <laughs> whatever the pattern is um, but listen to pop music like recently I, I, I'm I'm uh, very a favorite of the Japanese um, like 70s 80s city pop music when I listen to that music first of all I cannot understand Japanese <laughs> so I don't have to like think about the lyrics or the stuff which a choral conductor would do uh, but also my hands won't move which part will move my whole body will move I will like yeah, somehow like dancing, dancing. Oh, yeah so it's very releasing and chilling music, but if compared with like your uh, your experience just now, like the funk music and the guitar, the moment of the high notes that a uh, electronic guitar plays, at that part I believe is touching your nerve, uh, nerve. Sorry, it's touching your nerve, and then. Your body is like being motivated. It electrifies. Yeah, and, and then, I have to start dancing. Yes, yes, yes. right. Now also, it's just a different way of motivate people uh, by music. Different timbre, a tiny, tiny difference can make you like like a piece or dislike a piece. Not have to be oh this harmony I don't like or this uh, cliche chord progression not have to be that big maybe just one tiny different um, from the aesthetic view it will make you oh it's my favorite song or oh no <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's 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 quite interesting I mean it, but there's this idea with music that you know if you listen to a song even if it's a bad song for a hundred times you know, it will start. You will start remembering it, and you will start singing it. Um, the the constant repetition of it is well, going to make it very memorable. The worse the song is, the more brainwash. The more brainwash. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, yeah. Sometimes it happens, like those very easy to memorize. Those heat songs and then those hot songs. But you listen to it all the time on the radio, right? If it is like a radio, if it is number right, one on a billboard, yeah. yeah. Uh, but if it's really good song, good music, even you're tired, maybe the um, this week or this uh, couple months when the song is on the very top. But if the sun is really good after some days, you are still having, oh, I want to listen to that song again. It's always having that. People always having that moments. Like even right now, I'm, I'm listening to uh, some old Chinese pop music uh, or some old Korean pop music. Uh, yeah, in that time I listened like in during high school I listened. Uh, one song every day and then getting tired but still right now i feel like if you listen to it again mm, you know you oh, might start uh, incredible to, to, yeah. to sing after it again yes yeah. yes uh, i mean t tastes can be um quite peculiar i mean so this is another now roger story and then hopefully i'll stop with that <laughs> um uh but so in the in the late sixties, uh, when he was still in high school, there was a song. Which I think it was called "Sugar Sugar," mm -hmm. "Sugar Sugar," dun, 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 dun. Mm -hmm. um, and and when, and when he listened to that song the first time, he absolutely hated it. And mm -hmm. He said, oh, I, "This is a terrible song. Why would anybody listen to it?" Now it was uh, at the top of the single charts. It was a top forty. I, I don't think it was top one, but top forty. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, his music instructor back in, in the high school days 
was telling him, you know, if there are so many people who like to listen to it, which is the reason why it's in the top 40, mm. it must mean that the song um, is speaking to the soul of millions of strangers. Yeah, I, um, I like that uh, this description. And, uh, and, 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 and it was an important story to, to Rogers because whenever he writes a song, he composes a song, you know, pop song, some, some of them, a lot of them are going to be flops, right? Um, mm -hmm. But then some of them are going to be, you know, top 40, right? In the single charts. Uh, and I think it's one of his main, how should I say, motivations that, you know, like why does he compose the music? Well, I mean, it's in his blood. I mean, he, he, he dreams about music all the time. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason why he could be so prolific as a composer. A music writer, a producer, um, but it's something where he feels like when he goes on the concert and there's so many people who are singing after his song. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, whatever. We are family, lost in music. Um, I want your love. I mean, there's so many of these songs, and people, regardless. I mean, even if English is not the the native tongue, I mean, they go to concerts in Brazil or Eastern Europe or anywhere else yeah. and people still sing it with enthusiasm and he thinks to himself you know my audience become family members yeah. while they while he's making a concert True. Uh, and this is really uh, I say do, do, do you think that music has a mission um, for for you know it's not, not, not just for you know, the, the, the composers and the musicians, but for the audience. Yeah. Um, consider what you just said about like the current uh, or living composer communicate with his audience on a stage or whatever, uh, live concerts. Yeah, thinking about like Beethoven communicate with whether you through the funk, the funky arrangement or communicate with any other like um, music major students uh, isn't that fabulous like you said uh, non rogers communicate with his audience like, in person right or, well somehow side by side but those classic composers uh, they are communicate with us through their music sometimes well lots of times individually and your question about music uh, having whether having mission or not it's I think mm, wow it's very hard to answer because uh, part of me thinking arts shouldn't have a mission or intention because arts shouldn't like politics or science well actually I don't think science in the in the first place they will have the missions or sense of mission or the intention some great great invention probably it will happen like the story right it happens naturally coincident um, so I think arts shouldn't have a mission that behind or underneath uh, itself but music comforts people that it's also the facts that I can't deny so um, I think if a composer let's let's uh, jump into the aspects or view of a composer if he composes music I think it's hard to avoid uh, saying that oh I don't have any intention or my music doesn't have a mission your music or your intention it's obvious and should be obvious it's to make more people listen 
but to make more people hear your music. That's the, the very, very basic and necessary intention for me personally. I think, well, if, if I wrote music and then no one knows, no one sings, I will be, I will be so sad. Yeah. And my music should be so sad because, well, he born, but no one knows him. And it's just uh, shining by himself like a star upon the sky, but no one sees, sees it, or sees the star. Right, so you have one audience, but then um, like how important is the commercial aspect behind it? Because I know that in the contemporary you know, pop music field where you know, the, the, the record labels and the musicians uh, and you know, the, the tour guide, the managers, the people who work in the concert venues, um, yeah. etc. I mean, they ha they have to make money, right? They have to survive, uh, yeah. or they have to make profits or shareholders or whatever. Um, but uh, but I, I don't know. You you are in the world of, you know, you could say classical music. Um, to to what extent do you see commercial interests um, as being important? Uh, in the, in the music field, I think it's almost uh, the most important things. If uh, if we not talking about the music that happen uh, during the rehearsal or on the stage, the commercial is the most important things that whatever and a conductor or an orchestra, all those people. Those people need to eat, right? people need to get paid. So commercial you know, directly affects that how many, like the advertisements, right? Uh, propagating those, uh, a concert, they will affect how many audience can, will buy the tickets. And it will affect how many money that the orchestra can get and also the concert hall can, can earn. And also in effects that the emotion or uh, the sense of success for all the musicians who, who are on the stage because more audience that see uh, are being there of course they were happy they will be well some will get nervous but mainly you will be happy well consider as a concert that someone hold but <laughs> there's no audience or just one audience if there's only one and the performer performer may think that it's like his family right yeah. <laughs> in Chinese sometimes we say like the uh, uh, the, the only <laughs> audience will be there parents <laughs> their father or mother was, oh thank god you're here no one knows but only you can right so of course well com commercial i think it's very important for artists or musicians whatever. I, I, I can assure you that it's going to be at least one listener uh, of the podcast which is going to be my mother so i'll greet her here hi mom hi um and uh so <laughs> i can definitely uh <laughs> assure you that um uh, see uh, it is uh, your that, parents that that uh, that, that the, the parents are important uh, yeah. audience members for sure mm -hmm. um right. yeah uh so so yeah commercialism um is is, is important uh for your uh interests mm. um and um uh you would after this, um, yeah. Okay, so I, I'm I'm going to um, uh, come close to an end uh, uh, to this uh, uh, podcast. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I guess I'll leave it with one last question, perhaps. Um, uh, as I guess a piece of advice that you might have. 
generally for musicians uh, because you know, because we were talking about wow. the <laughs> commercial element behind it um, uh, and you know it, like th th does it make sense to become a musician um, in, in, sense in the current world yeah right mm. um, first of all I don't think like this uh, today's broadcast I answered your question perfectly because sometimes you ask me a question and then I jump to <laughs> maybe answer another question I say something that it's in my mind may not be strongly related to your question sorry about that <laughs> and part of my English no script, audience no um, so uh, um, talking about a suggestion to be a musician I whatever the current world is whatever uh, if it's a world uh, war situation or a peace situation or whatever the economics uh, goes whatever the politics goes to be an artist to studying arts being a musician studying music it's always at the best choice I will never stop suggesting or giving advice to to any anyone whatever younger than me or older than me I would say go for it go to learn music go for arts whatever what major you're in even now you can be a lawyer you can be uh, um, a doctor uh, you're maybe working in a hospital right now still yeah learn some music listen some music if you really love me music don't think about like making money or those stuff just have the guts go for it you will never regret what well, a lots of people may cannot making enough money for themselves right but why i'm still encouraged them to do that i don't know why but i will always encourage people not because of like I won't worry about people not making money but I will always suggest people to learn arts music all this stuff to be an artist to having all uh, always having the sensitive mind sensitive aesthetic view having a special taste all the time I think it's the the most different the most obvious thing that can tell people it's, it's different is from the the parts I mean I, I guess the, the key message is that you know valuing art you know aesthetic things uh, things that you don't necessarily uh, need to survive because you know we survive by you know food and you know a place to live you know shelter that, that's the core uh, of uh, economic life but it seems to be that you know once you have these basic necessities met mm. like let's say as you said you know you might work a different job or something like that um, and uh, you have some free time yeah you know, because th then I would think that pursuing art is a uh, is a very meaningful thing. I, I don't know. I want to quote um, um, Friedrich Nietzsche. He's mm -hmm. a, a famous uh, German philosopher, yeah. uh, and uh, and he was emphasizing how important it was to embrace art, to embrace music. Uh, f yeah, f yeah, yeah, music, f fiction, right? Really, mm -hmm. um, things that are not real, things that are illusions, right? Yes. Um, because there's something, I guess, as an existentialist, right? As a German existentialist, yes. There's something very sad about life, about existence. You know, um, yeah. I mean, it's great to be breathing and stuff like that, but then, you know, and assuming that you're like a healthy person, you 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 and you're working and whatever, but then you ask yourself in your free time. What is this all about? Like, you know, why am I waking up? You know, why do I put on my clothes? You know, um, yeah. and, uh, and 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 I think that 
like art and music, it's sort of like, it, it helps us deal with that uh, existential anxiety, you could say, of being on this planet, you know, yeah, as yeah. a human being. Yeah. You can never explain, to, like those, like you say, illusion. I remember Nietzsche, he probably s described music as a thing that it's um, exclu exclusive, uh, exclusive than any other uh, arts. That he, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I think he said music. It's the most uh, d different, special things that one can ever explain. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but also like. The, I think the ease of receiving music, you know, I think it's important, right? Because, I mean, you could, let's say you could read a novel, you could read fiction, right? Which is also a form of art. Um, yeah. but, I, but I think, let, let, let's, let's be honest, I mean, most people don't enjoy reading, mm. right? Because it, it takes effort, mm. it takes patience. Uh, I mean, I became an avid reader, that's why I could be an academic, I mean, because, you know, it's... <laughs> closely connected uh, you know to be first a reader and then you become an academic later on but for the normal person I think that you know the written word is um, is a challenge mm. uh, it's not easy you know people are busy you know people don't have the patience to read um, but it, it seems like with with music like even if you don't play an instrument even if you don't sing but yeah. you but you can still listen right yeah, uh, it just works on you. Um, I mean, isn't it also the case that before we had written cultures, right? Before we had script writing, um, the you know old communities they used to remember ideas and wisdom mm. uh, based on poems uh, and songs, right? Yeah. So it's like lyrics and songs, and you know people sing. The wisdom mm. uh, and it's because the music um, because it's easy to remember than the text uh, right um, yeah you have to have a tune yeah can help people remember the important poem. ideas you know like yes. uh, like oh you know you know, you, incest is bad, you know, or th things like that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> basic, the ba 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 basic rule, or, you know, you shouldn't kill people, you know, so it's like basic rules of society, right? Uh, yeah. You can input that into the music, uh, and, uh, and, and it's easy to access it. Mm -hmm. and, I think that, and I think that's the advantage that music as an art form has uh, over other art forms. Yeah, also, yeah, reasonable, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I would definitely agree, because I'm a musician. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, I mean, but that's, that, that's, what, that's what I love about music. I mean, even, like, I mean, I, I, I never studied any music theory. Um, I mean, all, this, this whole point of, like, you know, uh, four chords in the music, um, you know, the bass and the guitar line together, I mean, all of that stuff. I I I I I picked it up mm. because I love funk, right? It, it, it's it's not that you know oh, I love music theory and therefore I know music theory. Right? It's like I don't think one will <laughs> will love music theory at all. Or maybe some compositional geek that they will love like music theory. But I think theory um, as the there's a Mm, there's a one. I don't. I don't think uh, it's said by a uh, one uh, specific person, but lots of people had said this. It's like a theory came after the music. Yeah. See, yeah. I couldn't agree more that. Well, if someone wants to be a composer, I, I don't think the first thing he should learn it's theory. Well. Of course, he needs to learn some basic theory, like what is a triad, what is a, a key, a tonal. Um, but it's very simple. 
um, can take only like one hour watching YouTube video and then you, you will know all the stuff, the basic music theory. You don't need to like learn what is fugue, what is uh, canon, uh, those stuff, no need for that. Uh, what is a ninth chord, no, no, not necessary. But it's necessary, the first thing you do is it's writing down the notes. It's whatever you're thinking, just trying to write it down a melody. Maybe writing some accompaniment uh, below. Or you can try to just write a harmony progression, whatever is in your mind. You can start with the melody, you can start with the rhythm, you can start just a one note holding on the bass line to train yourself writing some other notes above can be two lines or can be three lines or you can imitate Bach's chorale and <laughs> four lines whatever you want first thing and most important thing is write is to write no, I, I, I thought it was to listen to listen to music listen it's and also then, important or yeah. well, if you listen enough not to say enough but very much uh, lots of music then I don't think one will write badly if he listened to so many music so. yeah I mean uh, but, but yeah, you know d dreaming about the song I think is very very important um, you know I want your love by Sheik you know Naharajas he was sleeping and then he woke up and he was dreaming every note of that song. Well, okay. I was <laughs> dreaming every note of that song. Um, so, okay. So I don't know. Uh, I may unbelieve uh, about this because I, for me, I think it's it's very um, it's impossible to like dream about the notes, the exact notes, like oh, it's D F E E flat. E, e. I think it's impossible. But I don't know very well about Noam Rogers and of course it's your idol and you respect him. <laughs> I, I, I trust his stories, I trust his rendition of it. And uh, I trust you, so okay. Okay, Royaga, okay, so thank you very much uh, for uh, this conversation. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I thank all my listeners of this podcast.